Greetings loves, it is I, Tactical Girlfriend. Welcome back to the channel. Hope everybody's doing well. Today, I'm going to be talking about de-escalation and use of force. How do you handle a potentially violent threat? How are you equipped to handle the level of danger that that threat may pose to you? How are you equipped socially, legally, and physically to defend yourself? As practitioners of self-defense, these are extremely important questions that we need to strategize around as self-defense all starts here. So without further ado, let's jump into it. But first, a disclaimer. This video is not going to be about equipment or skills or techniques. It's going to be about strategizing proactively how to handle potentially dangerous confrontations before you ever get into them. If you are serious about self-defense, then you absolutely cannot be reactive. You need to have a plan and you need to understand what you're doing and what the implications of your actions may have. Also, understand that this video is no substitute for legal advice. Always consult your local laws to better understand what is and what is not allowed in a potential self-defense situation. Also, understand what your settings and location may imply. Self-defense at a home may look very different from at a bar. Also, understand what is legally defined as justified use of force. Furthermore, understand what kind of tools you can employ to actually legally defend yourself, such as weapons, or also understand that you may or may not be disqualified from using them depending on your behavior. These are all very common conditions in local laws and will vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Now, there are generally three different courses of action in how you approach a potentially violent confrontation, and they go in order for a very good reason. The first, is avoidance and exit. If you can be situationally aware, pay attention to your surroundings, and avoid somebody who may want to pick a fight with you in the first place, then you absolutely need to do that. If you get into something that might be a little risky and somebody might be starting to try to confront you and you can exit, you absolutely need to leave. A lot of jurisdictions actually require you to do this legally. And if you actually escalate the situation further, you may be culpable for part, if not all of that fight. So make sure that you are not getting yourself into a situation in the first place, if you can help it. And if you do, and you can leave, then you absolutely need to take that exit. The second course of action is if your back is against a wall and you absolutely have no exit out of the situation and you are being confronted, but violence is not immediately being employed by the aggressor, then you absolutely need to try to get them to de-escalate. If you can have a dialogue with that person and save yourselves both a lot of pain and a lot of trouble, then you absolutely should do it. Again, always avoid a fight if you can. The third course of action is self-defense. If you have absolutely no way out of a confrontation, if it's not being de-escalated, and this person is an immediate bodily threat to you, then you may need to actually physically defend yourself. Now keep all of this in mind when you are in a potentially dangerous confrontation, see where you sit in there, what your options are, and understand that you need to actually meet that with appropriate reaction. Understand what you have available to you to use in your skill set, your tools, and how quickly and effectively you can employ them. Now let's talk a little bit more about de-escalation. With de-escalation, there's a few things that you really need to keep in mind. First of all, de-escalation starts with yourself. You can't create the space for someone else to be de-escalated if you can't de-escalate yourself. If you're ramping up tensions, then you're not de-escalating anything. You're simply escalating, obviously. But some people really don't seem to understand this. They flip the switch and it's just all go. And that's not going to actually help the entire situation. And it might get you into a lot of trouble. Understand what calms you, employ those strategies, and be ready to use them under stress. Also, understand that de-escalation is a noun, not a verb. You cannot actually de-escalate anyone else, only they can actually consciously make the decision to be de-escalated by themselves. You can create the space for them to do that, you can walk them through it, you can talk them through it, support them, but ultimately, they need to bring themselves from an agitated state to a state of calm with a very intentional decision. Also, some people might be dealing with diminished capacity. That is the potential for them to actually get control of their emotions and bring themselves from a state of agitation to a state of calm. They may be going through a crisis. They may be under the influence of mind altering substances that are contributing to their aggression. 
Nonetheless, you need to be able to actually anticipate this and make sure that you are equipped to handle that situation, assess your own capabilities to handle a situation like that, and be able to quickly resolve it and or leave that confrontation. All right, so how do we actually help someone de-escalate themselves? First of all, you validate them. If you see somebody angry and starting to lose control of their emotions, you simply acknowledge how they're feeling. It could be something like, hey man, I see that you're really agitated. What's going on? Do you want to talk about it? Everyone's feelings are valid and they want to be heard. A lot of the times that's all they really want and it doesn't need to go beyond this. Anger often manifests itself physically. Help somebody regain control by letting them be heard. If they're acknowledged and they've gotten all of that out of their system, they oftentimes will just return back to a more calm state. Also, just remember that just because you're trying to validate someone doesn't mean that they're actually validated. They're not validated until they feel validated. The second step is to help this person explore options. When somebody is angry, they usually have blinders on, they're hyper-focused, in the moment, impulsive, and potentially really dangerous. What you need to do next after validating them is simply talk about the implications of the actions that they may start to take and actually deal with those consequences if they were to take them. Then furthermore, weigh in on some alternative options that they have. Help them better understand that by focusing on all these options instead of their anger, they can actually take better courses of action and make better decisions for the long run. The third step is to allow for choice. When somebody feels more validated and has some options available for them, recognizing their freedom of choice will make them feel more respected. Once somebody feels more accepted and respected, they're gonna be a lot less defensive. Once you get them into this space, they will finally feel more emotionally safe to make a more rational decision and hopefully actually fully de-escalate the situation. As always, in a confrontation, leave when you can, use your body language when you can, and use your voice when you can. Only until those options have been fully exhausted can we even start to consider using force to defend ourselves. I will define use of force as the amount of force required to compel compliance and or successfully defend oneself from an attacker. When actually cornered by an attacker who definitely intends to actually attack you physically, there is a use of force continuum that I like to refer to. This is a tiered approach to actually handling and matching force in an appropriate manner. The first is presence. This can be screaming, it can be yelling for help, it can be whatever actually makes you present in that situation and apparent in order to actually either scare off the attacker and or get help from anyone who might be around you. The second tier is when we actually start getting into actual physical means of defending ourselves, and that's empty-handed. This could be punching, kicking, throwing, grappling, any non-lethal force that is employed only by your body alone in order to actually physically defend yourself in a violent confrontation. The third tier is less lethal, not to be confused with the term less than lethal because technically some of these can kill somebody in a very rare circumstance. Nonetheless, they're generally considered to not be lethal. This can be something like pepper spray, which a lot of people use, myself included. It could be a taser, not to be confused with a stun gun, which is absolutely not viable for self-defense, or a collapsible baton or anything else like that. Generally, these are used to compel compliance and discourage an attacker without killing them. The fourth and final tier, of course, is lethal. This includes firearms, knives, even chokeholds. Now, chokeholds are actually an open-handed technique, of course, but these are oftentimes considered lethal because you technically can and pretty easily kill somebody if you hold one for enough time. Carefully consider what may fall in this category as there is some gray area and that is open to legal interpretation. Typically, it's safe to assume that a defender can justifiably match the use of force of the attacker with similar justified force. Taking into context though, all the differences and similarities between the attacker and the defender, and this quickly becomes a bit of a gray area in the court of law. That may be weighed against the engagement, your abilities, your disadvantages and your vulnerabilities against that of the attacker. Take everything into context and better understand some hypothetical scenarios in which an attacker may or may not be justified in being defended against with certain implements. 
if the attacker is a very large, young, and strong person, and the defender is frail, small, and old, that is very asymmetrical, and more use of force from the defender may be justified. If the tables are turned, that actually will just be quite the opposite. So very, very carefully understand the nuances here, better understand your local laws, and how various hypothetical situations may go in a local court of law. As always, have a multi-tiered approach to your skill set and toolbox for self-defense. Get some martial arts training. Most fights happen with open hands, even if people have other implements on them. They oftentimes just can't get to them, and this is something that you absolutely don't want to overlook. Also, always carry less lethal means before you ever carry lethal means. You can't just shoot your way out of every situation. You can't stab your way out of every fight. And if you do, you're going to get into legal trouble in a lot of jurisdictions. So again, understand your local laws. I know I sound like a broken record, but you absolutely need to actually understand the implications of your actions and how you choose to defend yourself. With regards to lethal force, it should also be assumed that you cannot brandish that weapon in any justifiable manner. You should only present and employ lethal weapons in the case of your life being in immediate danger. Can you see the attacker? Is the attacker a culpable threat? Do they have the capacity and capability to act right then and there on said threat? Will a local court of law find you justified in defending yourself with deadly force then and there? These are all extremely important questions that you need to ask yourself and consider in various scenarios before you ever start to actually carry deadly force on you. Also, for firearm owners specifically, understand that warning shots are nothing but reckless. If you are firing a gun in a general vicinity of somebody in a self-defense situation, it better be at the attacker because you have absolutely no choice. Also, the idea of shooting at limbs for less lethality is absolutely ludicrous. You can still definitely kill somebody by shooting almost any part of their body. There is no way that you would be more justified in using that deadly force by saying it's less deadly. You're simply skirting the issue and not taking responsibility for your actions. Even if you are legally justified, I cannot stress enough how life-changing using lethal force is in a defensive situation and not for the better. Your life is never going to be the same. You're probably never going to recover from the trauma of that situation. You're going to experience all sorts of complications in court. Things are just going to be very different. And if you could avoid that situation at all possible, you absolutely need to. I need to stress that you need to take a multi-tiered approach to your defense. You can't be trigger happy. You can't be reckless. You need to have empathy and respect for your fellow human beings and try to avoid any situation where you'd have to take a life. That is the most important lesson I have for you here, and it's something that needs to be in the back of your head every time you think about self-defense. Also, be sure to do your homework. Various carry insurance companies like USCCA and US Law Shield offer comprehensive defensive training and legal advice to their clients. Take advantage of that. Also, have a contingency plan. If you were to ever employ lethal force in defending yourself, understand that the fight is not over then. There's always going to be legal troubles. There might be professional issues. You might have some social ramifications for that. Understand that there's a myriad of different things that you need to contend with, and it doesn't just end at defense. Well, I want to thank you all for sticking it out until the very end here. I know this subject is very heavy. It's very dry. It's not terribly glamorous or exciting but it is a conversation that we need to be having. So please feel free to chime in, in the comments below with your thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Also, if you found this video remotely insightful, please be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell too. Also, from the bottom of my heart, I wanna thank every single one of you Patreon supporters. You keep the lights on, you make this channel possible, and I couldn't do without you. I don't run ads here, everything that you see here comes from supportive viewers like you. If you want to go help out, you can always go to patreon.com slash tactical GF. The biggest contributors are named at the end of the video. And that's all I got for you today. I really appreciate you all tuning in. Please be good to each other out there. And as always, please take care. Bye.